Hey kids, Bob Murphy here with another Econ Moment. Today we're going to be talking about oil speculators and the situation in Iran. But first, a word from our sponsors. I'd like to draw your attention to these two books. The first one, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, is my attempt to just go through the general free market literature and give some of the major arguments for unrestrained capitalism, pointing out why typically government intervention makes things worse than what the interventionists are trying to solve. This book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal, focuses on what happened in the late 1920s and 30s, and it offers my explanation for why we had the stock market crash in 29, why Herbert Hoover actually made things worse, and it wasn't because he twiddled his thumbs, but instead he was actually a very activist president for the era, and why it wasn't the Federal Reserve's unwillingness to properly inflate that led to what we now call the Great Depression. Right? So that's how I make those arguments in that book. If you want to get the books, you can go to Amazon, and if you want a very convenient way to get there, just go to my personal blog, and on the left-hand side of the screen you see the direct links to the Amazon pages for these two books. My blog is called Free Advice. The URL is consultingbyrpn.com, or you can just Google Bob Murphy free advice and it should be one of the top hits. Okay, let's start talking again about Iran, oil speculators, and the price of oil. So the conventional wisdom here, touted by everyone from President Obama on down, is that speculators are driving up the price of oil and there's this element to the story, depending on the person making the accusation, that there's something nefarious going on. That, as usual, it's a case, allegedly, where people are personally profiting while causing misery to others. So the idea is, oh, these speculators are getting filthy rich by driving up the price of oil and hence the price of gasoline for the average Joe. And so this, of course, is supposed to be a really bad thing. And that's why the Justice Department, a few weeks ago, officially started looking into charges of speculation just to see if there's any skullduggery afoot in the financials markets to make sure that there's nothing going on that the government should crack down on. All right, so in this short video here, I want to just walk through the basic logic of how speculation works and why I actually believe, and many economists agree with me, that speculation... If it's successful, meaning if the speculators actually turn a profit from their activities, generally speaking, is socially useful. That it actually leads to changes in the economy that we would all want. So the speculators are performing a social function, just like other types of uh, workers are, or professionals. Okay, so let's work with a specific example just to see how this logic works. Let's say originally the price of crude oil is $80 a barrel. And the speculators, looking at the global situation, they think that war with Iran is imminent. They think that within the next one week, at the outside two weeks, bombs are going to start falling in the Middle East, and we're going to have a hot war, and there's going to be a major disruption in exports from the Middle East, at least for a month, maybe longer, while everybody readjusts, they uh, replenish the supply chains and so on, and, and work around whatever countermeasures the Iranian government might deploy. So for at least a good solid month, and they think this is going to kick in starting in a week or two, there's going to be a massive uh, disruption in oil availability to the rest of the world coming out of the Middle East. And they, the speculators predict that in that environment, man, the, the world price of crude oil could go up to 150, 200 even higher per barrel. So right now if the price of crude is only $80 a barrel then that means they think it's significantly undervalued. So what the speculators will do, not trying to help anybody else but just trying to personally profit from this information, is they'll go into what's called the futures markets. There's other things they could do too but let's just focus on this simple case. So a futures contract for oil Let's say it's, it's a one-month futures contract. What that is, it's saying the person who buys it, let's say it's a futures contract for oil with a, with a futures price 
of $85 per barrel. So what that's saying is the person who buys that is saying, one month from now, I'm going to buy a certain number of barrels of oil at $85 a piece. So I'm not giving you the money right now. I'm going to give it to you in one month's time at the rate of $85 per barrel, whatever the contract specifies is the number of barrels we're talking about. All right, so the person who sells the futures contract or goes short on it is taking the opposite position. They're saying one month from now we're going to deliver this many barrels of oil to you and you're going to give us $85 per barrel when this thing happens a month from now. So the speculators think that one month from now the actual spot price of oil will be much higher. It will be $150, $200, $250 a barrel. And so they would love at that point to be sitting on contracts saying we're going to buy barrels of crude oil from someone at $85 a barrel. Right? Because then they don't actually take physical delivery. They can just go sell that thing to somebody who, like an airline or a, a refinery, you know, some, some institution that needs to actually buy crude, they would just sell them that thing for the, the difference. Right, because that is a contract entitling the person to receive barrels of crude oil at 85 when actually the going price at that moment is much, much higher. Right? And so the speculator then reaps the difference between those two prices. All right, so if you just think through the logic of that, as more and more people are doing that, as the speculators are buying more and more of these futures prices or futures contracts, it pushes up the futures price. Because right? the people on the other side who are promising to deliver is, you know, it's probably like oil producers. They're just locking in future customers so that they're not having to sell everything at spot. That right now they can plan their activities over time. And so they are arranging to deliver barrels of crude oil one month from now, and they're locking in a price of eighty-five dollars. Is they're selling more and more of these things, you know, eventually they're going to realize, well, we can't deliver that many, so they're going to have to start raising prices. So the point is. This process will continue until the futures price of oil to be delivered in one month's time is much higher. So maybe it's, whatever, $200 a barrel. And so in that environment, what's going to happen? Well, the people right now selling oil on the spot market are going to hold it off. And they're going to start selling into the one month's futures market. So the price of oil today is going to start rising, even though the supply disruption hasn't occurred yet. For other people, like guys who own big oil tankers, they're going to say, holy cow, you're telling me I can buy oil today at $80 a barrel and then sell a bunch of these futures contracts at $200 and just stockpile the oil on my tanker, wait a month, and then deliver these barrels of oil for $200 each? Well, heck yeah, I'll do that. So it leads to people who have the ability today to start physically stockpiling oil too. All right, so just step back and, th and, and look at what's happened here. Because the speculators are certain that oil is going to be much more expensive in a short period of time, to enrich themselves, they're going to engage in activities that push up the futures price of oil. That high futures price relative to today's original spot price leads other people to start stockpiling oil in the present and it withdraws oil from present uses and starts setting it aside for future use or future use at the same time oil producers people who have excess capacity right now they start seeing today's spot price of oil going up and up and up so they're going to start pumping more than they otherwise would have as well so if you just think through all the ramifications of these activities what ends up happening is Today's spot price of oil starts rising until the point at which there's no longer an arbitrage between today's price and the one month futures price. And that's going to end up being much higher than the original $80. It's true. So yes, the speculators have caused oil prices today to be much higher than they otherwise would have been, but that's a good thing because the high oil prices today, not only does it motivate current producers to r crank up their output, but it also means motorists and other users of oil today cut way back on their consumption. So just again, think of these, these big trends of what's happening. you got people right now with excess capacity, like Saudi Arabia and others, 
who could be selling more physical barrels of oil if they wanted to, they're going to do that because the price of oil is higher than it otherwise would have been. So current output's higher. You've got people with the ability to physically stockpile oil have an incentive to do that. Okay, so the physical storing of oil above ground is going to increase our stockpiles, our inventories are going to build up. And the third thing is people right now who consume oil are going to cut way back. Now just think about that. If you were a central planner, if you were the world dictator who had nothing but the interest and welfare of all human beings in your heart, and that's the only thing you care about, and you knew that in one month's time there was going to be a massive supply disruption of oil exports from the Middle East, what would you do? You would order all your subjects to cut way back on consumption right now. You would order your subjects who had the physical ability to pump more barrels of oil out of the ground while they still could and get it into the network. And you would order the people who had the ability to stockpile oil to start doing so like crazy. So in other words, you would order the exact response that a market economy gives us. And so this is the sense in which oil speculation and other forms of speculation, if it's profitable, if it's successful, actually induces everyone to make adjustments to the situation that we would want them all to make if the underlying rationale is correct. Of course, if the speculators are wrong and there is no war, well then that's a bad thing from the point of view of adjusting, but that makes sense. And the market has built in mechanisms to punish that. If they guess wrong, they're going to lose. Last point, to avoid any possible misunderstanding here, obviously it's a bad thing on many dimensions if there's a war in the Middle East. So I'm not saying it's good if there's going to be a war. I'm saying, though, if we take it as a given that there is going to be a war and the speculators properly anticipate that, then the resulting ripples of behavior because of their actions are exactly what we would want to happen. So if there are people high up who are making foreign policy decisions and then those same people go and profit from it, you can say, on oh, that, that person's bad and I wish they didn't do that. Fair enough. But what I'm saying, it's not their trading on that information per se that's bad, it's their ordering of dropping bombs or what have you. That's the thing that's, that's bad. But then, in a sense, warning the rest of the world of what's coming by sending out information through the price system, that's actually a good thing. Okay, well that's all the time we have for today. Thanks everybody for watching this, another episode of Econ Moments, with me, Bob Murphy.